Good evening, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for having me and uh, giving me the chance to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, the First World War. Um, I was with the Hartford Current for 24 years as a reporter and editor. I left, I took a buyout in 08. I still freelance for them. Um, and, um, but my training was actually in uh, European history uh, as an undergraduate and graduate student. So history has always been a passion of mine. And um, in the 90s, I actually had the opportunity to tour the Western Front and uh, wrote a travel piece for The Current about it. And uh, it is still, if, ever get, if you ever get the chance or have been over into France and Belgium and had that opportunity, please take it because it, it is an eye-opening experience. And you really, to understand a lot of what happened in the 20th century and still in the 21st century, it all goes back to the First World War and what happened in the First World War. So um, grab the pointer here and uh, we'll get started. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, so first I want to show this slide, which I used in the book, just to kind of set the stage a little bit of what Hartford County and Hartford was like 100 years ago. Um, I don't know if everybody can see it all right, but um, this shows the populations of Hartford County in 1900, 1910, and 1920. Um, the city was about, about 80,000 in uh, 1900 and then grew to 138,000 in 20 years. That's a tremendous rate of growth. At the same type of rate of growth you saw in New Britain and in the county as generally, because this was an era of, of when Hartford was like the engine that drove a lot of the country's uh, industrialization. And I always thought one of the most interesting things and to really understand the demographics of this area back then is to look at the bottom parts of the two slides. The number of foreign born people living in Hartford County and or the number of uh, people who had one or both parents were foreign born. And you can see in the city, but also in Hartford County generally, you're talking about 70% of the population. What that reflected was the massive immigration from Eastern Europe, Italy, uh, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Canada, yeah, you know, in the uh, 1880s, 1890s. I mean, we, we still, you know, struggle with the immigration question today, but this, this was a real immigration issue back 100 years ago, so. And I did want to mention, too, uh, Simsbury's population at this period, uh, Simsbury, between 1900 and 1920 grew about 100 percent in population from about 2,000 to uh, 3,000 people. It was largely a, a farming community, but as you know, Ensign Bickford was here and there was some industrialization in Terrafield. So most of you probably have some understanding of the First World War. I, I, I use this slide because I like the colors for one thing, but you, know, you can see how different the, the Europe and the world looked like back then. Uh, you know, all of North Africa were European colonies. The Russian Empire, look how many countries in today was part of the Russian Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and of course, you know, the Ottoman Empire doesn't exist anymore and all these were casualties of the First World War. Okay, everybody knows about the Lusitania, but a lot of people think, well, we entered the war because of the Lusitania. Well, no, we didn't. The Lusitania was sunk in May of 1915. We entered the war uh, in April of 1917, so there's a two year difference. What the Lusitania, why it was important, and it was particularly important to this area because several uh, companies like North and Judd in New Britain had cargo on the Lusitania when it went down. So there were big you know, claims with travelers and some of the insurers. Um, but there were about 120 American lives lost, including 10 people from Connecticut. Um, what it did was it really kind of turned a lot of public opinion, largely through the efforts of the British Foreign Office against, against uh, the German Empire and the Kaiser, even back in 1915. And uh, actually relations got so strained that, uh, and there were more sinkings and more lives lost that finally um, the Kaiser and the, uh, the Admiralty in the German Empire pulled back from what was known as uh, unrestricted submarine warfare, at least for a while. Um, and and this is one of the more noted survivors of the uh, Lusitania. You probably recognize uh, Theodi Pope or Theodi Pope Riddle as she became uh, architect at the Hillstead and Avon Old Farm School. <coughs> so, Governor Marcus Henzey Holcomb, probably a name lost to a lot of local history, but he was actually the governor during all the First World War. 
Uh, he was elected in 1914. He was a sitting Superior Court judge. He was, took office at age 70. Um, and then he was uh, re-elected twice, so he served all th up to 1920. He was very conservative. Uh, he was opposed to women's suffrage. He was opposed to amending the state's blue laws at the time. But he's important in this period because he was, he, for his, he was a very, very active leader. And he was hostile to Germany. He was uh, friends with Th Theodore Roosevelt, who led the preparedness movement. Um, and he was actually, when in 1917 rolled around and we broke off relations, the Wilson administration broke off relations with Germany, he was the first uh, sitting governor to telegraph Was uh, Washington and say, hey, I'm, we're with you. So just think back 100 years ago this month, it's October 1916, um, the U.S. had been chasing Pancho Villa around me northern Mexico. Um, the Connecticut National Guard had been called out with the other state guards. They were on duty in uh, Arizona, basically swatting the flies, and it was pretty miserable duty. But uh, we, hadn't, we hadn't yet gone to war yet, but uh, it was pretty, getting pretty touchy with, with Germany. Um, and the uh, situation really changed in early 1917. There's a couple more slides of Governor Holcomb. You obviously probably recognize the old state house. And, and that cabin there was where the Liberty Loan drives were held. The Liberty Loan cabin, it became known. And that's the governor with a captured German field piece. So, 1917, early months of 1917. Um, Germany, because it realized the British blockade was starving the German Empire, they needed to, they, they, they thought we have to get back and start sinking ships. So they basically uh, went back to unrestricted submarine warfare, which meant uh, neutral shipping, if they were carrying contraband, was a target. And unlike the 18th century, you know, submarines just didn't pull over ships and move, you know, their passengers over into the, into their, the, the, the capturing ship and then sink or, t or take possession of the cargo. Submarines obviously took merchant ships down and everybody with them. So the preparedness movement had been going on. People like Theodore Roosevelt and Leonard Wood, the Army Chief of Staff, was, were organizing summer camps and saying, we're going to be getting into this fight eventually. Um, we got to be prepared because the U.S. Army at this point was pitifully small. You know, 100,000 was the U.S. size of the U.S. Army, where in battles like the Somme and Verdun in 1916, you're talking about between those two battles, millions of, a million casualties in those two battles, and they went on the entire, in, you know, all, all of the year, pretty much. So um, one of the things that Governor Holcomb does is he, he conducts what was called as the Connecticut Military Census. And uh, it was done, um, it was, took a census of all Connecticut males, citizens as well as aliens, between the ages of 16 and up, um, they also inventoried all the uh, state factories, farms, doctors, nurses, automobiles, anything that would have to be mobilized in times of war. And um, amazingly enough, when you think of government bureaucracy today, this census was done in two months. It was completed by, by, by early April. I, I mean, it was, you know, census takers were actually going into factories. Foremen, if the uh, factory workers didn't speak English, were helping them fill out the, the, uh, the forms. It was kind of an amazing accomplishment. Um, and all these census forms you can find if you're looking for like if your relative was was living in Simsbury back then you can go on ancestry.com and, and uh, click on the Connecticut military census and you can find the filled out census so I want to give you one example here of the Simsbury uh, man okay uh, you'll see the date this was done this particular individual was L Lewis Wesley Case he was 19, 18 years old Lived in Simsbury, 5 feet 10, 165 pounds, single. His occupation was given as a carpenter. You can see the date the census was taken, February 16, 1917. Um, some of the questions that you probably can't see it back there, but it would ask, what they wanted to know was, you know, anybody had any particular skills that the military could use? So they would ask, you know, uh, can you do any of the following? Ride a horse. Well, Lewis, you know, probably lived on a farm. He could ride a horse. Could he handle a team? Yeah, he could handle a team. Uh, does he know how to drive an automobile? No. Uh, can he ride a mo motorcycle? Yes, he can. Um, he, uh, he had some experience with steam engines, technical skills that the Army would have been looking for, and he was a good swimmer, so he joined the Marines. 
Uh, so in March 1917, we're still not at war yet, but the Connecticut legislature passed a bill to create what was called the uh, Home Guard. The reason this was done was that the, Na the Connecticut National Guard, the State Guard, would be called in federal service under the National Defense Act of 1916. So they knew that they, you know, if war came, they'd be called overseas. So what are you going to do for domestic security? Well, you created this Home Guard. And it was largely organized at, at the local level. So this is a picture of the, of, uh, taken of the, the Southington Home Guard. The bill was signed in March 21, uh, 1917 and March, March 1917, and it became very popular because it, there was, you know, older guys or people who wouldn't qualify otherwise for the military signed up and they'd get uniforms and they'd also get paid too. So there were, ended up being more home guard enlistees than there were equipment for them. So they finally had to cut off the enlistments at 20,000, but um, it became known as the Connecticut State Guard in 1918. Conne uh, Simsbury actually had the first uniformed and equipped state guard set up in Hartford County, so. That was a point of pride, obviously. <laughs> this is one of my favorite photographs I used it in the book. This is, this is a Home Guard machine gun patrol in Bushnell Park, if you can believe it. And, and if you see the little, the kid behind the, the, the pillar there, just like uh, the R Gang comedies, it's <laughs> that's a great picture. Oh, okay. There, there, there he is. Yeah. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so April 1917 comes around. One of the first things we were, Connecticut was concerned about was food. And, um, Connecticut was very dependent upon imports from the other states because so much of the manpower in the state had moved into the cities, was... Um, a lot of the, the farms weren't being uh, uh, farmed anymore, and the population had grown so fast that the farmers really couldn't keep up. So there was a huge push to, to, to get farmers to farm, to um, get home gardeners to garden, and um, this was a, uh, a poster put out by the uh, um, United States Food Administration and the uh, Committee of the Food Supply, which would be, was part of the Connecticut uh, State Council of Defense. Um, just an example, and, and potatoes were a big thing, and one of my favorite anecdotes I used it in the book was in New Britain, the uh, mayor at the time, George Quigley, um, he and the aldermen had put together a plan in 1917 to really increase potato production. So the, New Britain actually owned an acreage that was called a municipal farm that was used to grow produce and, and uh, to help feed the indigents. So they, he, they basically, <laughs> there was a, a scare uh, during the season that there was going to be a potato shortage or, you know, there was going to be some kind of blight that would damage the potatoes. And so um, they converted the whole municipal farm to potato acreage. Well, these will say the shortage didn't develop, so the city was stuck with all these potatoes. So the jo George Quigley uh, graciously decided to store the potatoes in his, in his home, in his basement. And you all know what happens with potatoes after they're stored for a long time. And a reporter asked him, well, uh, what, what, are you, what, what are you going to do about this mayor? And uh, the mayor said, if you ever saw, looked another potato, you could never look another potato in the eye again. So. <laughs> this is another one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> um, basically, the state was declaring war on any hen that wasn't laying eggs here. And um, they would actually send out um, from uh, inspectors and... Uh, representatives from the um, Poultry Department of the Connecticut Agricultural College, which became UConn, of course, uh, to give uh, uh, local farmers and poultry raisers lessons on how to cull, how to spot those layer, layers that aren't uh, laying properly. So I'm sure they came out to Simsbury because they, they, they would come out to t towns in the, uh, the counties. Okay, June 5th, 1917. War has been going on now for the U.S. has entered the war in, in April. Uh, obviously, one of the first requirements is to increase manpower because you're talking about a war in which millions of troops are in, engaged. Like I said, the United States Army was 100,000. So the, the only the second draft in the nation's history, first was in the Civil War. 
This was the draft registration day. There was two subsequent uh, draft registrations in 1918, but this was the first one. And how it was done was those military census were sent out to all the eligible males, and all of them were told to report you know, to their precinct, if it was Hartford, uh, this was this is a precinct at, near Morgan Street. Uh, it was so so many crowded that they had to bring in, uh, you know, uh, sleeping cars to, to handle registration tables. Smaller towns like Simsbury, the registrations were done at the town hall office. <coughs> so this is a registration card from a Simsbury man. Um, you can see the date, fifth of June, nineteen seventeen. It was done in the. Uh, uh, clerk's office. I predicted, I, I, I picked this particular one for a reason. Um, some of you might know who Joseph Tomalinas was. Um, he, he, when he registered, he, um, he was 23 years old, I believe, if my math's right. Um, he was single. He, um, Come to find, he lived on a, on a uh, he was a natural born citizen. He'd been born in, the, in New York City. His parents were both from Lithuania, which was then part of the Russian Empire. Um, and he, uh, that's what a registration card looked like. And again, all these, all these registration cards are accessible, digitalized on Ancestry, so uh, we'll get back to Joseph in a little while. This is what, um, this is the Hall of Records in Hartford. Um, this is where, when the draft call-up was done, everybody reported to this, to this office. Um, and um, so this is where the draft boards were set up, where they did the uh, exemptions were granted if somebody's uh, job in a factory was critical to the war industries, or if there was a health reason, um, and they had the medical board set up. And, th and this uh, next slide, these are uh, local African Americans. Now, this, the army was segregated in the First World War. The, the blacks were drafted. That's how, that's how bl most uh, black Americans entered uh, World War I. They were, but they were kept in segregated units. And in fact, um, the two combat divisions that actually went into to France, the, the uh, major one, the 92nd uh, Division, was under French command. Uh, was there any upper age limit that didn't have to report? Upper age limit? Yeah, did they cut it off at 40 or 50, or something like that? Yeah, I'm sure they did. I, 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 yeah, they, they had so many numbers initially, it was, you know, it was more a question initially of, well, it, it, the person is a, is a tool and die specialist, and of course all the tool and dies were being converted to, to war production. If his job was particularly sensitive, he was more likely to, get, to, be, uh, to be granted exemption that way. Um, yeah, I, I, they weren't drafting people 55, 60 years old, but, but the, home, the home guard might take them. Yeah, that, that, was, that was the key. You know, if, you, if you knew you weren't going to be drafted, you signed up for the home guard, you, you, know, you, you did on duty in Connecticut, and you still got paid for it. So. <laughs> Uh, and okay, so one of the um, first world wars noted for was the propaganda machine that was put in motion to stir up patriotism. Uh, a lot of people today have no idea why we went into the first world war. A hundred years ago, people didn't know why not necessarily why we went into the first world war. Because remember, in 1916, Woodrow Wilson ran on a platform. He kept us out of war. Well, he didn't keep us out of war in 1917. So there was a lot of confusion and a lot of people, you know. It was, it was, had no idea why the country was, was going into war. So there was the, um, in Washington, there was the George Creel, who you might have heard of, set up the Committee of Public Information, which coordinated all the posters, um, artworks, you know, everything to, to drum up as much patriotism as possible. And the state of Connecticut was particularly adept at this. I mean, the state of Connecticut probably outdid George Creel. They had some, they, under the Council of State Defense, they, there was their own publicity committee, and they not only you know, developed their own posters, but there were war rallies all over the state constantly, big war rallies, and at the local level where uh, the efforts was channeled through the war bureaus, there were speakers, there were um, four-minute men speakers, if you know what those were. This was the era bef before 
talkies in the movies, and so they would have to change the reels, and that would take about four or five minutes, and during that period, somebody would stand up and say, hey, we're gonna hang the Kaiser, and let's go get them guys, and go out and enlist, and that's, that's how they got the name. But one of the interesting things was Connecticut actually developed something called the Liberty Chorus. This was, grew out of Hartford High School uh, during a, a big war rally in 1917, and it became so popular, it spread through all the country, uh, over the country, and, and uh, the, what it was was they, they did patriotic songs and they would pre perform the songs at the rallies, and uh, it re everybody really got into it, and uh, people who were, they, it spread to Massachusetts, then it spread throughout the Northeast, and then they ended up sending the uh, head of the Connecticut Public Safety Committee all the way out to the West Coast to, to uh, help people better, better plan their rallies and their, their courses and things like that. So they were good at it. And parades were another big deal. I mean, the parades during this period were massive. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Keep in mind, this was before television, you know, uh, you know and uh, even, even radio to a large degree. And uh, so you know, it was a big deal when you had a parade. Everybody showed up for a parade. So. Um, this is just a, a slide I, I took of one from, uh, this is a Red Cross parade in New Britain. Um, <laughs> this was actually the, the only American produced anti-aircraft gun, which looks pretty rudimentary by today, but uh, the uh, weapons development during the First World War was, was uh, quite spectacular. This is the, another float from that parade. And everybody probably recognizes the Athenaeum here. Uh, this was a uh, Liberty Loan drive. Uh, there were four Liberty Loans. This is how, this is how money was raised to support the war through liber the sale of bonds and, and what we call war saving stamps, which were sold in smaller den denominations. Um, there were four Liberty Loan drives uh, during the war and one called the Victory Loan Drive afterwards. And Connecticut really pretty much led the country in the, in the percentage of subscriptions per population. In fact, um, they did so well that after the war, after the Fifth Liberty Loan Drive went through, the flag that f flew over the U.S. Capitol during the entire war was donated to Connecticut for their being so good at raising money. <clears throat> um, one, of the, one of the things during the First World War, of course, is with the manpower demands, a lot of factories that hadn't hired women before uh, needed women and, and not this is from this is from cold firearms um, but factories all over Connecticut were, were employing women um, the typewriter companies uh, Royal and you know was, was very adept at, at hiring females and they actually put in a daycare center because they needed uh, they, obviously the, uh, young women needed some place to care for their children so um, I mentioned I, this slide, uh, you're probably aware that Ensign Bickford, at the, at the end of the war, 11 days after the armistice, had a terrific explosion that killed two young women and, and uh, uh, wounded or Ill, uh, injured four others uh, who were, they were involved in making fuses for hand grenades. War, war production was still going on even though the armistice had just ended. So it was, could be dangerous work. This was... Uh, one thing I've, I've told people about the First World War, it was, it was total war. And what that means is all society was involved. Uh, so different from wars today where we have, you know, basically a paid military and a lot of society really has not, not a lot in touch with the veterans and their families and everything. In, th in this case, the war touched everybody, much like the Second World War did, much like the Civil War did, only this was a shorter duration. So, you know, even young girls were enlisted in helping uh, knit uh, sweaters and and socks and uh, do what they can. This was a Red Cross photo. Okay, so we finally, we're in the war. Uh, it takes us pretty much a year to get built up to send, start sending troops over there. The first American units went over into France uh, in the summer of 1917. We really didn't get into the front lines until late 1917, early 1918. Um, this, this slide I, 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 I I'm just use as kind of an example just to show where some of the major um, activity that the United States troops were involved in. Uh, in 1918, uh, by then, uh, the Tsar had fallen. 
Um, in late 1917, the Bolsheviks had taken over Russia. Both sides were, were pretty much exhausted, the Allies and, and uh, um, Austria and German Empire. Germany realized they had one, one shot to win the war at this point. What they did was once, once the, the Bolsheviks signed the peace treaty at Brest-Litovsk, Germany was able to bring all those divisions west. And it was basically going to be okay, we're going to have one shot to break through the Western Front. Um, so, beginning in late March, March 20th, 1918, through about middle of July, the, German, the Germans under Ludendorff attempted several massive assaults to try to break through the lines. And the most one of the biggest was in March, and that almost that was very nearly broke the line, and it was it was concentrated against the British forces up here, and then in, in June, uh, the Second Battle of the Marne, where the United States really got it, really helped the French. At that time, the United States Army General Pershing wanted the United States Army fighting as a separate unit, but it was a desperate situation, so the American divisions that were involved were put under French command, and that was at Chateau Thierry, which is. Uh, the Ein Marne area right here. And then the Meuse Argonne, which was the major effort by American military forces, still the greatest battle ever fought by United States forces. Even bigger than the Battle of Bulge, largely forgotten today. Most casualties, most men involved. Um, I visited the Meuse Argonne Cemetery in the 90s, and one of the interesting things the superintendent told us was. No, no sitting American president had ever been there before, which is kind of amazing when you think there were 26,000 Americans who were, who were killed in that battle and largely buried in that cemetery. But that, that was down in this area here. Um, and I want to read one, one section to you. Um, some of you, so by 1917, or 198, by, by the spring of 1918, the American forces are starting to arrive in force. And what was the, what was the impact on, on the British and the Allies when this happened? I want to read just this one section from Vera Britton's famous memoir, Test, uh, Testament of Youth. Vera Britton was a um, uh, British woman. She was educated at Oxford. She uh, went into the, uh, the um, nursing service during the war. She lost her fiance. She lost her brother. She lost her two closest male friends. And uh, it's a very moving memoir even today. She was written in the 1930s. This is what she talked about when she's, up, she's out at base hospital and she sees the American troops come marching by. They look larger than ordinary men. Their tall, straight figures were in vivid contrast to the undersized armies of pale recruits to which we had grown accustomed. At first I thought their spruce, clean uniforms were those of officers, yet obviously they could not be officers, for there was too many of them. They seemed as it were Tommies in heaven. Yet had yet another regiment been conjured out of our depleted dominions? I wondered, watching them move with such rhythm, such dignity, and serene consciousness of self-respect. But I knew the colonial troops so well, and these were different. They were assured where the Australians were aggressive, self-possessed where the New, Ze New Zealanders were turbulent. Then I heard an excited exclamation from a group of sisters behind me. Look, look, here are the Americans. So, um, one of the first major engagements that American troops were involved in is the Battle of Shippery. Um, and this is kind of important to Connecticut because one of the, it was involved the 102nd Infantry Regiment, which was part of the 26th Division, a National Guard Division. And the 102nd was composed of the 1st Connecticut Infantry National Guard and the 2nd Connecticut Infantry National Guard. So there were a lot of uh, Connecticut troops who were involved in this particular battle. And um, a lot of, quite a few were killed. This is Major George Rao. He was a hero at Shippery. He died. He was probably Hartford's greatest hero of the First World War. He was killed uh, during the uh, Second Battle of La Marne at the outside Chateau Thierry. Okay, the war ends. Good photo of the armistice uh, in Hartford. Everybody know who Sergeant Stubby was? Sergeant Stubby was the, probably the greatest animal 
hero of the First World War, and he was a Connecticut dog. <laughs> and his story is fascinating. It's, he's actually, there's actually been books written about him and everything. He was kind of a mongrel, looks kind of like a pit bull. When the 1st and 2nd Connecticut Infantry were combined with the 26th Division, they were encamped in New Haven. So this dog wanders in. He's, he's taken under the wing of a New Britain uh, private, later corporal, and becomes, becomes like the mascot. They smuggle him on board a ship going to France. He stays with them the entire, and the 102nd is basically there. So what, it's the first fully formed, the, 20, the 26th Division is the first fully formed division in France. They get to France in October of 1917. They're all there through the armistice and into uh, early 1919 before they're brought back. So they, they saw it all. They were, it was one of the, they, they suffered the third or fourth highest number of casualties. So, so anyway, Sergeant Stubby, he, um, he's under fire, he's gassed, he's wounded, he's by shrapnel. He captures a German, uh, couple, a German prisoner. He sniffs out like gas bombs. What you see him wearing there is a vest that a group of French ladies knitted for him because he became so popular and he was actually received all these ribbons on him. He was decorated by General Pershing. He, was, he met three U.S. presidents, including Wilson, when he was over in France. When after the war, um, Sergeant Stubby and, and uh, his master, um, he, he became the uh, football mascot for Georgetown University. He became, like, they, they would take him around to a, a American Legion post around the country. He became very, very popular, and today Sergeant Stubby is stuffed in the Smithsonian, so. Oh, <laughs> but all, of, all those ribbons, yeah, he was actually decorated. And there you see, when this, the, the second photo is from the, uh, in April 1919, the Victory Parade. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's right on uh, Trumbull Street, right near the Arch, so. <laughs> all right, so. We come back to um, Joe Tomalinas. Tomalinas. Um, after the war, the state librarian, a fellow by the name of George Goddard, commissioned something called the Connecticut Military Service Questionnaire. What this was, was a questionnaire that was sent out to all returning uh, veterans uh, or their, uh, depend their uh, descendants if the veteran died. And uh, it's a remarkable record. They're in the state library. They're digitalized also on Ancestry. Not everybody filled them out, of course, um, but probably maybe 30 or 40 percent returns. But it, it's pretty much a complete record of that particular individual service. And although I don't have a whole, didn't uh, uh, digitalize an entire one, it not only asks everything about parentage and what you did before the war, you know, where you were um, assigned. Um, you know, what battles you saw, there were actually sessions, sections for narrative describing, you know, what it was like to be in combat, you know, do you have any regrets about doing this? Um, so some of them are pretty in interesting reading. So um, this one was filled out by, by Joe's mother. Joe died at Chippery, the battle I mentioned earlier. Um, he, um, before the war, he, he worked in a, a school of wireless in Waterbury. And he was living at Terrafil at the time. He was uh, drafted, inducted. Uh, he, was, he was with the 102nd. He received uh, training at Camp Devons in Massachusetts. Where a lot of Connecticut uh, draftees ended up at Camp Devons, um, and killed in action. And this is a civilian photograph. A lot of in a lot of these uh, files, uh, loved ones would have attached pictures. Of their of their soldier or the soldier himself might have and this and this was uh, Joe in uniform and this was the other uh, Simsbury hero uh, George Hall young man 20 National Guardsman <coughs> died in the Mers Argonne and uh, the these two men gave after the war Congress uh, at, um, chartered the American Legion and um, American Legion posts began springing up all over the country and, and, and uh, state of Connecticut. And Simsbury's American Legion post, which was the um, 84th chartered in the state in 1920, became the Tomalinas Hall post because of these two individuals. Um, so the, some the visible remembrances of the war today, you might recognize uh, Walnut Hill Park Memorial on the, on the left and the Bristol Memorial on the right. Um, this was the state 
Connecticut Service Medal that was commissioned. Uh, a lot of towns actually commissioned their own uh, ribbons or, or uh, medals. I don't know if Simsbury did or not. Um, and then <clears throat> in large part, one of the, the greatest memorials of the war is the uh, uh, State Veterans Home and Hospital in Rocky Hill, which was opened in 1940. It was, uh, with, it was constructed with WPA money. Uh, what happened was the, um, the home and hospital for soldiers that was set up during the Civil War was in Darien, but, uh, but it had become obviously overburdened. Uh, you had this influx of, of doughboys returning. Um, the Depression hits. Um, it needed to be a place to care for them because a lot of them not only came back with wounds, but gas, you know, the effects of gas w was, was awful. Uh, and um, before, there was, before the, um, the home and hospital was built, that was actually a, uh, that property had been taken over by the state. It was a farm, and during the um, mid-30s, a lot of vets were basically camping out on the farm, including some of the bonus marchers, if you remember from history, who had gone down uh, to Washington, D.C. Um, try to get the bonus collected that Congress had uh, promised and the fire hoses and machine guns were turned on them. So sad story, but they were, they were, uh, they were camped out there as well. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, so happy to answer you. any questions. <clears throat> um, probably my dad was in World War I. I don't know the exact month that he went over, but I do know it was fairly late. I think it was after that major battle, he was a rifle instructor. And I was born in 33, so I never really, uh, World War II came along before I ever got to really talk to him about war and stuff like that. But the main thing I remember, he never talked too much about it, but was that uh, the men that came over there, he, he called them cannon fodder. He said they, the training over here before they were sent over was practically nil. Um, he had hunted with his brothers, but he was teaching them how to clean a rifle, and they were going up to the uh, front line in that state. He was very disgusted with the amount of training, and one of his big hopes in World War II was that we would train our, our troops better than that. I think that was a lesson learned. I mean, we, we sent, you know, one of the things that was set up were machine gun units. There were no machine guns. Basically, our troops were using French machine guns the entire war, and, and finally Browning's at the end of the war. Uh, but you know, we had we were not producing any kind of weaponry. You know, it's uh, you know the the, the uh, American Air Service was flying you know French planes. Mm -hmm. You know, the tanks were British. Um, it, so yes, the the equipment and and uh, until we got Snoopy's camel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But one of the things that, you know, Pershing certainly had his faults. I don't know how, you know, history is a very mixed opinion of him, but one of the things, he was determined that he, he had seen what, you know, trench warfare had done over there. I mean, you cannot imagine how awful the trench warfare had been the first three or four years. I have, I have a, a section here, I, I won't read it, but uh, it's a memoir by the uh, famous uh, World War I poet Sigrid Sassoon, who was a uh, infantry officer in the First World War, and he wrote um, a autobiographical, though fictitious memoir about his service. It was pretty much true what happened to him. And you read some of the passages in there, and he was decorated officer and just awful. I mean, just in the conditions, I mean, even when you weren't getting blasted by artillery or gas was coming over, you know, you're sleeping with rats or lice, and it just, you know, you can't imagine the conditions. So. One of the things, my wife, I can't remember the author, but my wife gave me the, the all three books of a trilogy by some, if I heard the name, I'd recognize the author, but he starts with World War I, with families from England, France, Germany, and America. And his second book in the trilogy, World War II, and all of those families have children, um, two males in each family, and he follows it through. But one of the things in this first uh, volume that I had never read anywhere before, and I'm wondering how true it is, is that during a long time of trench warfare, both sides got so fed up with it, and every once in a while they have to charge up and get shot and hung up in barbed wire and stuff, and that both the German side and the Allied side 
uh, at one point stopped and dug trenches in between the two lines and literally lived there uh, for the peaceful times, you know, until both sides got fed up with it and went in and, and shot them. Well, there was a famous episode in 1914, the Christmas, so-called Christmas truce, where both sides basically, you know, throughout the front, front line, the German and, and British officers were out kicking soccer balls and exchanging punches and whatnot. And that, that you know, the fraternization got to such a degree that, you know, it really concerned the officers and the higher ups and they, they broke it off in a hurry. So, yeah, yeah it, uh, I, I'm sure those incidents did happen. One of the things I didn't mention was, even prior to the United States entering the war, and I, I wrote about this in the book, one of the things that really surprised me was how, um, because Connecticut had such a high percentage of foreign-born and you know people whose roots were one generation removed from Europe, you had like people uh, leaving, joining up in Canada as a neutral nation. The United States wasn't allowing other countries to actually you know to do uh, sign up people right here, but you know there were whole groups of like Italians that went up and joined up and went over you know to join Italy, which entered the war in 1915 and and uh, people going back, a few went back to fight for Germany, Austria, Hungary, most of, most of it went back to fight for France or, or Britain, um, but you know, they're very strong connections. Yeah. One thing I was very interested in was the whole bit about the potatoes early on. Um, I have relatives in Omaha, Nebraska, and my son and I are arguing over who has the original of this, but anyway, we came in, in through possession of a whole bunch of handwritten pencil letters from my first wife's grandmother who lived in Omaha during World War I. And she wrote, the last letter that she wrote um, was in the middle of 19, or early 1918. And she mentioned how food shortages were showing up. This is in the middle of a farm country. Mm -hmm. And although they were in Omaha itself, and one of the sentences that really struck me, I hope the potato crop is better this year because we'll at least have something to eat. Uh -huh. Now that was the first place I'd ever read that there were food shortages. Was that true throughout the United States? Or? Well, keep in mind, you know, there was rationing. There, was, there were strict, stringent conservation methods taken. So that's why people were encouraged to have home gardens and to can or jar their own, their, what they produced. And uh, there were meatless days and wheatless days. And, you know, you, you, you can go and find like, uh, you know, re recipes how to make uh, rye flour palatable and things like that, so. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there was, a, in Simsbury, a, a, during the First World War, it was uh, when <laughs> Ethel, Miss Ethel Walker was about to buy the Dodge Estate and start her school, mm -hmm. you know, but in the transition there, when they were trying to sell the place, that the agent was Reverend Croft, and, um, he asked the town if they would like to use those fields for um, war production food, you know, and they did actually plant potatoes and corn and um, hire people to tend it and harvest it and all that. But that, that was only one year before Miss Walker came along <laughs> with her school and, and they didn't need that anymore, I guess, yeah. by that point. So potatoes and corn. I noticed they talked about wheat. I didn't realize wheat was grown in this part of the country. Like mm -hmm. Early in the possession, they said instead of- well, they were at, There were actually efforts to increase wheat, wheat cultivation in Connecticut, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and the other thing I didn't mention was, of course, in this period, uh, in 1918, the great influenza, epidemic was at its height. Uh, we're talking about uh, it entered Connecticut in around uh, early September. Uh, so, you know, the state is not only fighting the Kaiser, it's like fighting the influenza, which uh, claimed a lot of lives in, in, in Connecticut. And uh, um, one of the uh, places really hard hit was Camp Devens, where, because you had all these troops, you know, in cantonments and, and in close proximity, you had a lot of trained doctors and nurses who'd been sent over to France, so you were calling up the volunteers, the Red Cross, or anybody that could help out in nursing. And uh, um, <laughs> I was reading one of the, uh, during the war, Stanley Works in New Britain uh, put out this uh, monthly uh, 
newsletter. It's called the Stanley Worker, and during the flu influenza, they put you know what to do when the influenza, and they actually talked about you know don't just spit on the floor. We have spittoons put out. You know you know you don't don't spread the flu by spitting in the wrong places. So. Mm -hmm. I was also interested to see. Uh, I wasn't sure they had done that much hiring of women in World War I. Of course, I was familiar with the World War II. Yeah. But it's, it's it's not, all the way back to World War I. It's a very overlooked fact, yes. Uh, female factory workers doubled between 1913 and 1918. Of course, when the, when the troops came back, they, the women pretty much lost their jobs, went back to the, the home lives. So, yeah. yeah. That was one of the biggest problems Truman had to handle at the end of World War II mm -hmm. was all the women had kept all those factories right when he going and here come the guys who want their job back. <laughs> and that was, that was almost as big a problem for him as deciding whether to use the atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, I, I just want to point something out. Um, you have books to sell, right? And how much are they? Uh, $20. $20. We have them in the bag if anyone wanted them. If you could ask about any more questions. I did want to point out that we have George Hall's letters home. Oh, okay. He sent home. So we have a, a book of all the letters he sent home to his mother and some to other family members here. And we are going to have them on our website once, our new website, once it's finished. But if anyone's interested in looking at them, they're really fun. And I, what my, my goal is to get kids to look at these because when he's asking for hard candies and sweaters and just the, the random, hard, please send a hard cake or something, you know, like the. It's really interesting, and and they have and they're censored, which I think would be really kind of fun. And they're like words cut out for the for kids to see it. I think would be fun. One of the things in the letters I read, a lot of the troops were always asking for newspapers or magazines because they wanted to see what was going on in Connecticut. Because, because you know, being in the field, there'd be a lot of drudgery between, uh, you know, the intense uh, activity of combat. So they were always wanting reading materials or. or he re he refers yeah. to the whole, the whole Farmington Valley. Yeah. I read about the, the basketball team. Too bad you lost. How's the new bank coming? So it is kind of fun to look at the references. So, so sorry to interrupt. Any more any more questions? Well, um, Kilt was the big factory in Hartford. Yeah, the major arms manufacturer. Yeah. What else was around that was going full tilt? Pretty much everything. Uh, Pratt and Whitney Tool. You know. Yeah. Uh, the typewriter companies Royal, I mentioned, Royal, there, yes, yeah. but everybody was pretty much converted to war production. And Not, must have been oh yeah, Stanley and, and yeah. Um, I came from Bristol, so New Departure was big time. In Bristol, yeah, Landers Ferry Clark was a big producer of like canteens and uh, mess kits and all that sort of stuff. Every, every pretty much every every manufacturer was either if they weren't doing like. The, you know, here's a, here, an interesting fact. In 1917, this is from the Governor Holcomb, before the before the United States entered the war, you know, and we, we've seen in the last 10 years all the debate in, about uh, firearms in Connecticut and everything. In 1917, Connecticut was producing 53% of the nation's munitions, guns and ammo. Mm -hmm. That's a staggering number because you had Remington, obviously, and Winchester. Uh, the Remington plant in Bridgeport was just huge. It's just huge. It's just huge. Been and the Springfield Armory, yeah. That that that's in addition to what Connecticut was yeah, producing. Yeah. So, and and Colt was like the, um, they were like, they had the contract for the Vickers machine gun from Britain. So they couldn't even, they, they didn't have the manpower to produce them there. So they were producing in New Haven and, and elsewhere. And uh, um, they were responsible for the Browning, which was the next advancement in machine gun. And um, obviously the Colt 45 was the sidearm that. Uh, uh, not just the U.S. Army did use, but the British How about Army. Horse stuff, you know. A lot of the Brit New Britain manufacturers were, were manufacturing tackle. This is yeah, what I yeah, to. yeah. And there was actually a tannery that was operating right in Hartford. Oh really? When the Park River hadn't been buried yet, so I mean they <laughs> they, they were going they were in war production too. So you can imagine what that probably smelled like right oh, downtown. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I, I've been through that book that. Uh, she brought up there, read all George Hall's letters. I knew George Hall's son. Oh, yeah. Also George quite well. Um, but one thing that jumped out at me in those letters was when he found out that they had sent one of the letters to the Hartford Current and published it, and he didn't like that. <laughs> and in fact, he wrote back and asked them not to do it, but they kept uh, sending it to the Hartford Current. He must, have been, he must have been a Hartford Times reader, I guess. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.